So a lot of people think that they can just get into this business and figure it out as you go. They think they're just going to have the entrepreneurial mindset and be like, oh, I just got to jump in and do it. That's what I thought. That's why I got started in two weeks after jumping in. But I think you need to spend, it doesn't have to be a long time. You don't have to do the whole analysis paralysis thing. You don't have to spend a year mulling over what you want to do. It literally took me only 30 days to truly sit down, put some deep thought into it with myself and my wife and really craft out what we wanted our life to look like. Because once you can figure that out, once you can figure out the lifestyle and everything else that you want, it's really easy to reverse engineer and figure out what you need to do to get there. Are you looking to achieve massive success in your life without dealing with costly investment nightmares? If yes, then this is the podcast for you. Here, we provide engineers and busy professionals all the secrets and strategies to create multiple streams of income, build generational wealth, and live a meaningful life by design. Here's your host, Ted Patel. Welcome, Decoding Cashflow listeners. Today, we have a special guest, Josh Ferrari. Uh, He's a founder of Ferrari Capitals, co-founder of Three Beach Capitals. He had been working as an aircraft technician for a while, and now he's a multifamily syndicator, have raised millions of dollars from investor. And he's also the host of a podcast called Creative Capital. Welcome, Josh, to the show. Nice to have you here. Glad to be here, man. We were just joking before we started recording that this is a TED Talk 2.0, so I'm excited. I, I hope I get that many subscriptions, you know, <laughs> TED Talk. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> you never know. Yep. So, uh, Josh, uh, uh, let you know, I know you recently moved to Florida. It might be exciting for you. Uh, new chapter. Uh you know, in the life. Uh, but before we dive deep into, you know, uh, your real estate business, what do you do? How do you do it? Let's go back into uh, into your story, like way back. Uh, how did you get started? What did you do before you got into real estate? If you can tell us, listener, about the background, please. Absolutely. So Josh Ferrari, Um, I was a full-time aircraft technician when I first even thought that real estate investing was going to be a thing for me. (laughs) I, uh, that was what I went to college for, got my airframe and power plant license, moved from Memphis, Tennessee to Southern Alabama to start what I thought was going to be a longstanding career in aviation. Was super excited, thought I was going to work up the corporate ladder and eventually work for a larger company and make, you know, $150,000 was really like the 30 year max out pay. And that was the American dream for me. I had no other aspirations outside of that, aside from uh, getting married and having kids and raising a family. It wasn't until January of 2018 that my dad called me up one just random day and told me that him and my mom were getting ready to start flipping houses. And I was like, hmm, that's very interesting. Uh, And it was one of those, if you can do it, I can do it kind of conversations. I was like, man, if my dad can figure it out, I can definitely figure it out. So just asking him, like, you know, are there any resources that you read, listened to, like places you went, people you talked to, podcasts, like books, anything that you figured out that helped you? reach even the mindset of realizing that real estate was what you wanted to do. Uh, mm-hmm. And if so, what are some of those things? Could you give me, give me some. So he kind of introduced me to all the Robert Kiyosaki books, bigger pockets, a couple of other things in the space. And I just pretty much jumped right in. So my wife and I were super excited, super stoked to get into this business. And I've always been very much one that kind of, uh, the the opposite of the analysis paralysis type personality. Uh-huh. So a lot of people think that they're, they they want to chat about something, mull it over, think about it for like a year, multiple years before they do anything. For me, it was less than two weeks before we had decided we were going to do it, jumped in and went full scale into wholesaling, just kind of like flipping contracts for any of you out there listening who don't really know what wholesaling is. You're basically like a realtor without a license. So I thought that was going to be my ticket to not necessarily riches, but my my ticket to make a little bit of money so that I could ultimately mm-hmm. buy something. Well, six months goes by. We didn't close a single deal. Realized we could have cared less about creating a wholesaling empire. It wasn't really conducive to the lifestyle we wanted to build. So we pivoted and bought a fourplex, thinking that was going to be the answer. 
super excited about that. The intent was to house hack it, live in one of the units, rent out the other three. I did all the work myself. I did all the property management, all the construction management, all the CapEx, all the everything. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a huge learning experience. And when it was all said and done, pretty much anything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And we ended up losing about $60,000 on that particular investment. So through the process of that, my wife and I were able to get really crystal clear on what we actually wanted to get out of life. Because up until then, we thought we knew, but we really had no idea. We didn't take time to truly sit down and get vivid about our future. So once we were able to do that, this was now February of 2019, we made the decision that large-scale commercial multifamily syndications is what we were going to do. 100%, that was all we were going to focus our efforts on. No more shiny object syndrome. So after getting really focused, I got a mentor. So I had tried to do everything all by myself up until this point. I had tried to do everything by myself with the wholesaling and everything by myself with the full flex. And neither of those panned out. I ended up losing a ton of money and wasting a ton of time. So I had heard from a bunch of people reading books, going to different real estate investor meetups, going to conferences, just networking with people that mentors seem to be a yeah. huge component to people's rapid success. So I'm like, why should I be any different? So I went out, found a mentor immediately. He just so happened to be local to my area. And then after getting that mentor, learned a ton in a two-year time frame. So pretty much was underneath him for about two years, um, learning pretty much everything that there is to know about commercial multifamily syndication. Uh, mm -hmm. And I found my two business partners along the way. I found one on Bigger Pockets, and the other one was actually introduced to me through my mentor. Um, and then it wasn't until December of 2020, so about two years later, when we actually closed our first deal, which is a 42 unit here locally in Southern Alabama. And then from then till now, it's been about 30 months or so, and we've closed over 874 units. We have over 65 million asset center management. We've personally raised over $25 million from various passive investors over the last two years. Uh, we started our own property management company last year that now has five full-time employees. We also have four full-time employees in Ferrari Capital. So we're slowly starting to scale and do some vertical vertical integration there. Um, mm -hmm. As you mentioned earlier, I started the podcast Creative Capital back in April of 2020 with the intent really just to learn more from people. I really enjoyed podcasts and I really wanted to just control the narrative. There were so many things I wanted to know from all these really smart people. And the hosts of the shows that I was listening to weren't asking the questions I wanted to know. So I was like, I'm just going to host my own show and then ask all the questions I want to know. And hopefully these are equally questions that everybody else wants to know. So that show's yeah. kind of exploded since we've been running it now for over three years. And we have almost a million downloads and 60,000 people that tune in monthly. It's It's been a blast. Um, and then... and summer of last year so around june july of 2022 after about 18 months of actually closing multifamily deals i was finally making enough money to be able to quit my day job so up until then everything that i was doing was me working as a full-time aircraft technician full-time husband and trying to be full-time real estate investor, right? Working on the side with real estate, but it really wasn't a side gig at all. It was 40 plus hour weeks. Um, so I was burning the candle at 17 different ends. And that was the only way that I saw fit to achieve what I wanted to achieve in a short time frame. Um, it was definitely a lot of short-term sacrifice, but well worth it in the long haul. So 18 months later, finally made enough money. Then I made the decision that, hey, look, I'm going to reinvest into myself. I haven't had a mentor. I haven't had a coach. I haven't had someone kind of like pour into me that's higher up than me, like in a further position that I want to be in since I hired the initial mentor getting into this business. And then I didn't really have him throughout the time frame that I was in it. So it was just me and the business partner. So I was like, I'm going to reinvest. So I invested over $100,000 back into coaches and mentors and my education. And summer of last year, literally just 12 months later, I'm more than 40 x the revenue that I was making from the day job to where I am today, literally in just a 12 month time frame. So coaches, mentors are absolutely incredible to my ability and to a lot of people's ability to succeed. So with that same thought, realizing and understanding the power that mentors had in my life, I made the decision back in summer of last year to start my own mastermind, to start my own mentorship program 
and to teach other people out there that were just like myself, that didn't have a lot of money, that needed to understand what those creative routes were to be able to get into the business and mm -hmm. learned on a very hands-on basis, not just watching videos, but literally let's work together hand in hand. Um, I knew I could help those people. So I launched a mastermind in summer of last year, and we've now had over 50 students join the program. They've closed over 950 units. They've raised over $35 million of equity. They have another 1,200 plus units under contract, all newbies, all starting from scratch, all just in the last 12 months. So it's been a blast running that. It's really been a blast doing everything that I've been up to. So all that to say, that is my real estate investing journey that I started five and a half years ago. Awesome, man. Uh, what a progress. And uh, as you rightly said, right, mentors are important in the life, no matter, you know, it's a business or, you know, a life coach, mindset coach, whatever you need. But um, uh, at, at one point, if you want to, you know, uh, shorten the time frame of your success, mentors are important. Uh, they, whatever you're planning to achieve in next five years, you put a mentor, they'll help you achieve in two years. And on top of that, right, uh, uh, you can learn from their mistakes. You don't have to make your mistakes on your own. Uh, they will they will guide you. They will, uh, uh, based on the earlier mistakes that they have done. So you don't have to lose millions. So, of course, uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's a great thing. Um, going back to the other, uh, you know, aspect where you said you started with wholesale and, um, you know, try to do... Uh, fourplexes what well, you you had your parents like why why didn't you join your parents business like what so my parents lived in memphis tennessee and uh -huh. i was living in southern alabama at the time so we were about six hours away from each other uh -huh. and they were really wanting to flip houses and i never okay. really saw myself wanting to flip a house like i did a lot of the construction and the work on the fourplex mm -hmm. but for me i never saw it as a house flip i saw it as like a live-in house hack rental type thing, or I was just going to hold it long term and rent it. And they mm -hmm. were strictly just wanting to do flips. So I didn't really want to do flips. Um, I also just wasn't sure if I wanted to get in the family business, so to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if it was maybe some stinginess on my part where I felt like I needed to own 100% of the equity or if it was literally just I didn't know if we were going to be able to mm -hmm. work uh, super well together. If I'm being honest with you, I've never put too much thought into it. But made the jump to do our own thing in mobile just me and my wife and it turned out all right. yeah right. independent thinking right there were there yeah. were some failures along the way but it turned out all right that's great so in multifamily syndication uh what what are the main markets you focus on right now josh just the coastal uh, areas uh, which... before before you go ahead right i've seen uh you are you have been investing in memphis and alabama a lot right so not uh, Memphis, actually, even though no, I'm from Mississippi, Memphis. my bad. Yeah, Mississippi, Mississippi. Yeah. So a lot of our portfolio is in southern Mississippi and southern Alabama. And okay. we have one deal up in Austin, Texas. So okay. that's really kind of a one off. I don't know that we're really heavily focusing on the Austin or even just the Texas markets in general. Mm -hmm. But Mississippi and Alabama are kind of our primary bread and butter. We're really coastal with a lot of our properties right now which is a uh, downside with where we're at right now with insurance premiums and everything that's going on with all of that. So we're in the process of overcoming that roadblock, creating something mm -hmm. similar to a master policy to be able to get cheaper premiums. But mm -hmm. as we grow, we're looking at potentially branching out into some of the more Northern regions of the markets that we're already in, in both Mississippi and Alabama. As further North we go, the cheaper the premiums will be, the more the Right, the lesser the operating expense ratio is, the more the deal actually makes financial sense. We Away also from the ocean. To, right. We also happen to have a deal already in Montgomery, Alabama, which is about three hours north of the coast. So we really mm -hmm. like that market. Uh, I like some other markets in Mississippi, and myself and one of my other business partners. There's three of us total, but two mm -hmm. of us actually live in Tampa now. You were mentioning I just moved to Florida. Just moved to Florida literally this week. Uh, all brand new to me, but now we both live in the Tampa market. So we may or may not be interested in expanding here, but the premiums are equally ridiculously expensive here as well. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see if this becomes a market that we, that we target. Mm -hmm. Any, any specific criteria that you keep in mind by selecting the markets? Uh, you know, uh, I think locale is a huge one. Uh, we just need to be somewhat local. 
And when I say somewhat local, I mean within like a one to two hour driving distance probably is, is comfortable um, because there's a lot of on-site work that has to be yes. done when you buy these larger complexes. And a lot of people don't really put two and two together when they're thinking about doing a deal. They just go out and do a deal for the sake of doing a deal. Now, if you're going to be partnering with someone else who's going to be the asset manager or the primary sponsor for a deal, and you're not local, then that's different. If they already are familiar with the area and have a big portfolio there and a big mm -hmm. team there, then maybe that makes yeah. a ton of sense for you to invest in that deal or become a part of it. But for us, we basically do pretty much everything in house now. We do all of our own sourcing, we do all of our own capital raising, we do all of our own due diligence, we do all of our own acquisitions, mm -hmm. we do all of our own asset management, and now we're starting to do all of our own property management. So because we do everything in-house, we need to be somewhat local in where we choose to target these investments so that one, we can scale. As we look to continue to grow, we want to have something centrally located so it makes it easy to continue to rinse and repeat. But two, we just need to be able to be boots on the ground pretty quickly. We need to be able to keep eyes on it. And I don't want to have to be always getting on a plane and flying multiple hours away to see something and then getting a rental car to drive there and it takes too much time away from the family. And the whole reason I started this business was to create a company that was going to allow me to have not only passive income, but time freedom, and my ability to go on vacations and do things and didn't make me, I didn't want to be the crutch in my business where if I'm not working every day, all the time, 60 to 80 hours a week, then the business isn't succeeding. And we've been able to create a business now where I work probably like 15 or some odd hours a week. And that's pretty much all we need to run our $65 million portfolio, operations, acquisitions. And then I probably work another 10 to 15 hours a week on top of that with all of my mastermind, coaching, um, podcasts, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, great. Uh, same here. Uh, we, we've, we have been doing you know, uh, ground up constructions for luxury single family homes here in New Jersey, as well as mm -hmm. uh, small multifamily developments uh, below 20 units, you know, 20, 25 units. Uh, and I, I just focus here in Jersey, uh, New Jersey because uh, I want to have the property or the project going on where I can have my foot, if not every day, but at least two or three times a week. I can oversee the project. Yes, for multifamily syndications that we do, uh, we do invest... Uh, in uh, in southern states, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, uh, but for the new construction projects, I'm strictly within a couple of hours from my driving distance. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah same thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, in your company, right? As you mentioned, you are total three partners. Like, where wh what are the your roles and responsibilities uh, uh, in your company? Uh, are you more in the asset management, more on the investors relationship, acquisitions? Where do you stand? How does it work for you? Good question. So I handle all the investor relations. I pretty much raise the majority, if not all of the capital. Uh, I deal with all the ongoing re relations, uh, relationships, communications, K1s, distributions, all those things on the investor relations side of the house. I'm also kind of the marketer slash face of the brand of what we do. So most people haven't heard of either of my business partners because they're not that active on social media. They don't have a really large presence. So I've basically branded us as Ferrari Capital to be the face of everything that we do. So everyone kind of funnels through me. I'm kind of the top of funnel. And then once, once I schedule a call with them or as we're messaging on LinkedIn or messaging anywhere, I kind of make the determination of whether or not I need to communicate with them or whether or not either of my business partners needs to, depending on what it is we're going to be discussing. Yeah. So I handle all of marketing, branding for us. I handle all of the kind of like online presence, all of the uh, investor relations, all the capital raising. And then also that's kind of why I have the podcast and the mentorship program as well is because it all kind of ties into the branding and marketing of who we are as a company. So I also really just like to educate people uh, on both of those avenues on how to do what it is that we're doing. Reggie is our primary asset manager. So he handles all the day-to-day -day operations. I shouldn't say all. We, we, try to, we try to divvy up roles a little bit there where it's not all relying on his shoulders. Uh, but he handles a lot. He handles a lot of the day-to-day, -day, a lot of the month-to-month, quarter-to-quarter. Uh, we have a bookkeeper that's on staff. So he directly connects with the bookkeeper 
and the bookkeeper finalizes, uh, basically keeps the books for every asset that we have. And then our like entity higher level investments. And then he's kind of the final set of eyes overseas. He's like the forensic accountant, we call him, uh, that gets to take a look at all that, finalize the numbers. And then once he finalizes them, he sends them to me. And that's when I would send out distributions or send out those that information to the investors or do what, do what have you. Uh, he also handles all of our insurance relationships, insurance claims, if we had any. He handles all of our lending relationships when we had new deals. He handles a lot of the due diligence. We all kind of had our own roles with due diligence, but he handles a lot of the on-site due diligence. Um, also, just because he's local to Southern Alabama, so that helps a lot. Uh, but he's also just like engineer background, so he's a very detail-oriented kind of guy um, that helps helps a lot with asset management specifically he does he deals with a lot of the construction management as well capex budgeting future planning um he helps with a lot of things and then we've got matt the last partner when we first were getting started in this business he was helping us a lot with kind of our kp role helping us meet the net worth and liquidity requirements he also had access to some other investors to help us raise more money in the early phases uh, he still helps us with those things, but now pretty much as an entity, we qualify for everything that we need to. So uh, he just helps bolster bolster that. He also helps with operations. So we've got asset management, which is a lot of the day-to-day -day of what Reggie does. And when I say operations, I mean like systems and processes. So Matt's really good at creating processes for what it is that we are doing. So once we've done something five, 10 times, he's like, we need a process for this because we just have to yeah. keep doing it over and over again. So he'll then create a system behind it that we'll utilize uh, con consecutively, whether that be something as simple as a spreadsheet or whether it be something a little bit more complex, like integrating different software systems and, and things that make things a little bit more streamlined. Yeah, um, absolutely. So the he pro also- process, helped... process are important, right? Uh, they, those are the things- uh, which uh, you can just give it to someone and they can run through it and you don't have to present in the business uh, all the time. They, uh, so, yeah. So that's a little, that's basically, that's a lot of what we do. All right. Of the, right. the separated roles. Uh, as a part of the investor's relationship, as you mentioned, right? Uh, have you been having any, like uh, any, uh, I would say concerns from the investors. Have you have you seen any concerns from the investors with uh, all this, uh, you know, uh, news in the media about uh, the because of the interest rate, right? That is a uh, uh, for the commercial real estate, uh, not for multifamily. I would say, but uh, for the office space especially, there's a lot of concern in the news on how it might pivot in next couple of years. Have you heard anything? such from your investors yeah i mean we're not in the office space literally at all so i couldn't directly speak to that but as far as just investor sentiment uh, investor yeah. confidence it's definitely shifted a little bit over the last 12 months but i think really what you need to do now if you're looking to get into this business or if you're already in it and you're struggling to figure out how to raise money as deals are coming up if you're finding any deals it's really just education so it's educating your investors on what is happening right now on why this is actually a beneficial time to invest, how it can be beneficial, and how you're actually structuring or executing on a particular investment to be able to overcome the concerns that investors would have in a particular investment. Making sure that you're a little less leveraged, making sure that you're getting a little bit smarter with the way that you structure the debt, whether you're actually yeah. doing some kind of local bank debt, agency debt, or if you're going creative and doing some kind of owner financing or something like that, and then explaining to them what that means and why it's important that we have this and how this is beneficial and where we're at right now in this investment cycle. And then also having backup plans. So you have your initial yeah. exit strategy, your initial kind of business plan that you're setting up as you're crafting this deal and getting ready to pitch it to investors. But once like if that fails, what's the backup plan? How can they be, how can you mitigate the risk? So that if whatever you're trying to do doesn't work because everything crumbles and falls apart, what are you going to be able to do to prevent everyone from one, losing their money? Cause that's everyone's biggest concern. Yep. And two, making sure that you can still like after no one's losing money, then you want to try to make sure that you're still achieving 
the returns that you projected initially that you would achieve, whether it be in the same time frame or whether it be slightly delayed. Trying to at least come somewhat close to that ballpark will keep, will boost and co boost confidence in your investors and make them interested in wanting to take the leap. Now, there's going to be some things that are completely out of your control. Some people are just going to be scared about things that they have going on in their own personal life and they don't want to invest the money and they're just not the right fit for you. Then don't beat yourself up thinking, why can't I raise any money? Everyone I talk to is like, doesn't want to invest. Yeah. And it could just be the people that you're talking to. You're not talking to the right people. You're not targeting the right kind of an individual. You don't have the right branding marketing strategy to reach out to these particular individuals. So maybe you just need to tweak some things on your end there, or maybe the way that you're pitching the deal isn't that great. Maybe you're not exuding confidence and you yourself sound like skittish and scared about what's going on with the market. And they're like, so what do you think is going on? And you're like, I mean, I really have no idea, but we're going to do this deal because you don't want to lose to inflation and you want appreciation with real estate. And then people are like, well, not really. You know, I want, yeah. I want you to know what you're doing if I'm going to give you my money. So I don't know, a couple of things there. All that to say, we've definitely seen confidence shift slightly, but it hasn't diminished or depleted our ability to raise by any means. We'd yeah. actually closed the deal earlier this year and we were able to raise all the money in a couple of weeks, which wasn't, which was actually pretty quick for, for us. So we were um, excited to see that people were still that interested. And that was back in February or March of this year. So we actually haven't done a deal since then, which... Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people aren't doing deals right now. I've seen a lot of people be like, I'm looking, but I'm not doing anything. And we're definitely not going to do a deal just for the sake of doing one. So yeah. we want to make sure we're finding the right one. So we have a ton of deals that we're looking at, just nothing concrete enough to pursue. Yeah. So everything boils down to the numbers, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, of course, um, what I think is, you know, with uh, the current situation, the mark, the interest rate now Fed might or might not go at the most like 25 basis point up. So at, on, on the interest rate side, we are pretty sure like it, there won't be any major change in interest rate. Uh, in future, it is going to come down, but not go up more than maybe 25 basis point, right? So taking that into consideration, I would say, you know, if you find a good deal, which pencils out with the current interest rate, then uh, down the road, you can always refinance it, and that that will add, uh, you know, uh, additional cash flow to the business. It's a possibility. I've also heard talks of some people say they think interest rate, and you know, no one really knows. Yeah. But I've heard talks of some people say that they think interest rates are going to stay right where they're at for like the next decade. They're like, I don't think they're really going to go down. We saw unprecedented, unprecedented low interest rates in the last decade or so. And I think that now that we're at seven, six, seven, eight percent, I think we're going to stay right around here for the next decade or so before we see any new shift. And this was like some professional economist that I saw like post yeah. an article or something. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know if I believe that, but uh, there's, there's definitely a lot of talk of what's going to happen. And either way it goes, whatever happens, this is where exuding confidence comes into play and having backup strategies and backup plans for an investment that you're looking to execute on, making yeah. sure that you have everything in line so that you're not going to fail. You were mentioning a refinance. If the goal is to do a refinance and call it three to five years, you don't want to get a loan that matures in three to five years. You want to get a Absolutely. loan that matures in like seven to 10 years. 10 years. So you have a massive buffer and all those extra years of if craziness does happen, you have a ton of extra time to pivot, switch, do something. And you're not forced to sell, losing everyone's money, making a terrible investment. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's what I would say. All right. Um, any, so you have been doing multiple deals. A any deals that you came across was like, you know, uh, too risky or... Um, the deal went south and what did you do for, to, you know, bring it up to the mark? Anything like a deal least? that we, the deal that we closed that went south and then we turned it around or a deal that we didn't close. And anything, either way. Yeah. Either way. So you put a lot a, of effort, you put a lot of effort, but it didn't work out as you wanted to. And uh, Yeah. We've had a lot of those deals, um, but in terms of a lot of effort, 
we had got one deal under contract in January of 2022 when the market mm-hmm. was still hot. There was no even thought that interest rates were going to do what they did uh, and ever deals were still flying off the shelf. We got a 300 acre parcel of land under contract in Franklin, Tennessee, it's about 30 minutes south of Nashville. Mm-hmm. And we were partnering with a huge developer up there where we were basically going to bring in all of the equity and they were going to deal with all of the actual development. It was going to end up needing about 70 to $80 million worth of equity, which is the most amount of money we'd mm-hmm. ever raised. But we were super excited to do it, super excited for the opportunity for this particular investment. Mm-hmm. Because similar to what it sounds like you actually do in your business, this was going to be a luxury single family development. All 300 acres is going to equate to about 60 or 75 luxury single family homes on three to five acre parcels. It was going to be this like big master plan community that was going to have all these really nice amenities in the in the area. And the homes were going to literally go for, I think anywhere between three to six million dollars was going to be the sale price when everything was all said and done. So the fact that it was super luxury made it a very unique type of investment. So all of our standard investors that were interested in all the deals we had done up to that point through multifamily weren't really interested in this. One, because it wasn't multifamily. Two, because it wasn't like a long-term hold, like they had come to know and love from the model that we've kind of chosen to provide. Mm -hmm. And then three, the fact that it was like a for sale product, people were a little unsure about. So it was really difficult to raise the capital. We were going to a lot of different uh, larger institutional type uh, investors. And then April rolled around, things got crazy with interest rates, things started going up and up and up and the market got worse and worse and worse and worse. And then it wasn't until December when we finally just decided we had to back out of the deal. We weren't going to be able to raise the cash. We weren't going to be able to close it. Uh, So pretty much a full year of being under contract on this deal, going through all the due diligence of a new development of a new construction on a really large scale, 300 acres, all luxury. We were communicating with like designers in Paris and people over here in in Germany and like engineers over here. Like it was just people from all around the world going to be a part of this really, really cool product we were going to build. And it was Mm -hmm. really awesome to get to meet those people, build those networks, create those relationships um, yeah. but it ended up all falling apart. And I think we lost like a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars in due diligence costs. Uh, we ended up getting our earnest money back. We were actually gonna owner finance that deal, believe it or not. But even with owner financing, we still needed the equity to actually mm-hmm. do the build out, which we couldn't get. So we ended up backing out. But mm-hmm. uh, we after backing out. Got our earnest money back, but lost about 100 to 150 grand on all the due diligence that we went through that process. So the lessons learned there were just that new development is a behemoth. So we need to understand that we're going to need a much longer due diligence and closing time frame if we're going to do anything new development in the future. Yeah. And then number two lesson that I say we learned is the luxury market is an extremely unique market mm-hmm. that I don't know that we want to necessarily be a part of. Uh, yeah. It was very complex. There's a lot of money to be made, right? The payday at the end yeah. of the, like a three, four year time frame when all this was done being developed was going to be like eight figures, which was obviously the enticing thing that made us want to do it in the first place. But it's it's very difficult. Yeah. And I'm just going to leave that to the people that love that market. <laughs> yeah. So rightly said, you know, uh, uh, the thing is investors also, right? There are different kind of investors. Some of them <clears throat> who were just, uh, who just wants cash flow? Like you know, they get a quarterly check, uh, you know, or monthly check, whatever they need. And some of them are, you know, they need a high return at the end of the day, compared to, you know, if you compare the quarterly cash flow returns, in in the construction they get higher return one time at the end of the project, but you know they have to wait for it. So the investor uh, investors are also, you know, different. Um, and as you mentioned, right, uh, this is a unique, uh, thing, luxury single family houses. So it, uh, the, the location, the people who buy it, 
uh, their taste. You need you need to be very you know familiar with some of the luxury home, right? They need a sauna bath, they need a dog house, or maybe you know. So those are the things you know. Like uh, uh, you need to make sure you know what what you want to put in these luxury uh, homes. I was really excited for the product we were going to build. Like we yeah. we got to see some of the designs for the homes. I'm telling you, we did we did a lot of work as we were prepping to get ready to close to start this process. Mm -hmm. And we were literally going to have one of those uh, one of those houses that has like an indoor pool, basically. So it's like indoor outdoor, right in the center yeah. of the house. Yeah. It's going to be like a big lap pool almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was all going to uh, I don't even know how to explain it, but just open concept was, was really the concept of the build out. And I was like, man, I'd, I'd love to live in a house like this. This is definitely luxury, multiple million dollar house. Uh, yeah. So, all right. Hey, uh, Josh, uh, keeping time in mind, you know, let's switch gears and uh, we can move on to the final round questions. You ready? I'm ready. All right. So the first one, uh, which is the book that you'll recommend, which had a main, which had an impact on your life or your business? Well, I don't want to say the same book that everyone always says, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So instead, first, I will recommend people read it. But the book that I'll actually say to answer the question will be Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willing. That book was mm -hmm. really impactful for me because I guess as far as being a really great leader, it's really a leadership book. Uh, so how to be an effective leader, how to be an effective entrepreneur, an effective business owner, how to lead other people. And you have to take extreme ownership. So that benefited me on the business side of what I was doing and having business mm -hmm. partners and beginning to hire employees. But shoot, it also helped me in my marriage, just taking extreme ownership about everything and just swallowing the pride and just accepting that you're flawed, that you make mistakes yeah. and yeah. apologizing for those. I don't mistakes. even want to go in there. Exactly. You know? yeah. so, I, don't, I don't want my wife to hear my podcast and come back to me. So... <laughs> Exactly. So it helped. It helped a lot. I recommend that book to anybody. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. And what is the best uh, business or you know uh, investment advice you'd like to give to our listener? The first thing I would say is just get clarity. So I didn't have clarity in the wholesaling, and I didn't have clarity in the fourplex, and I lost a ton of money, and I wasted a ton of time. So a lot of people think that they can just get into this business and figure it out as you go. They think they're just going to have the entrepreneurial mindset and be like, "Oh, I just got to jump in and do it." That's what I thought. That's why I got started in two weeks after jumping in. But I think you need to spend, it doesn't have to be a long time. You don't have to do the whole analysis paralysis thing. You don't have to spend yeah. a year mulling over what you want to do. It literally took me only 30 days to truly sit down, put some deep thought into it with myself and my wife and really craft out what we wanted our life to look like. Because once you can figure that out, once you can figure out the lifestyle and everything else that you want, it's really easy to reverse engineer and figure out what you need to do to get there. And if you don't know what you need to do to get there, that's where your network, that's where coaches, that's where mentors, that's where people like that come into play in helping you achieve those goals. But they're not even going to be able to help you achieve those goals if you yourself don't have clarity about what you want. Yeah, absolutely. So it's about mindset, right? You have to have that mindset to achieve the goals, put the strategies, planning together, and along with the mentor, you know, to mm -hmm. get it through. Absolutely. Um what is the one way you like to go back to the world? The one way I like to give back. Um, well, I got the podcast. I don't know that I would say that's the one way, but I've always loved doing exactly what it is that we're doing here right now of just telling people about this business and, and doing it completely for free, like just blabbing about it, giving people all the secrets all uh, the sauce, right? Wh whatever you want to call it about how to be successful in this business. Because there are so many people that don't know that this, that real estate investing in general exists. And then even if they did know that real estate investing exists, they don't know anything about something like syndication, the power of what it can do to, to help you. And, and maybe syndication is not even for you. And if so, that's completely fine. There are literally thousands of different ways to invest in real estate and make a ton of money. You yeah. just have to pick one that works best for you, that you get really excited about, that you have a fire for, and go after it. So I like to give back by just giving away as much free content as possible on social media, going to as many meetups as I can, going to conferences and talking about it, talking about it on the street with random strangers, like just 
letting people know, spreading the good news, I guess you could even say about that this is a possibility that can absolutely revolutionize your life. And if you have a passion for it, like I do, then I definitely think this is something that you as an individual should pursue. And if you don't, then maybe it's not a right fit for you. Real estate investing might not be right for everyone, but you're not going to know if you don't know that it exists. So just letting as many people know about it as possible. All right. Uh, final question, Josh. Uh, how can Decoding Cash Flow listeners get in touch with you? Great question. So you can check out our website at ferraricapital.com. Um, and then if you go to the website, scroll all the way to the bottom, you can either fill out a contact us form, reach out to me, you can schedule a call with me there. You can find our links to our social media, follow me on Facebook and LinkedIn. Those are the two platforms I'm most active on. We also have a YouTube channel, but we're usually not super active on that. You can also follow our podcast, Creative Capital, going over to the website. Or if you wanted to learn more about the mastermind, that's on the website as well. So I would say just go to the website. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Josh. Thanks for joining us today. It was a pleasure talking to you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Decoding Cashflow, brought to you by Aster Capital. If you found value in this episode, then please share it with someone who you think could benefit from it. And make sure to act on what you've learned. If you want Ted Patel to personally help you reach your goals, then feel free to set up a one-on-one -on -one call with him. Also, visit us at astercapital.com for more free resources. Content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. As always, please consult your own advisor before making any investment decisions or setting a course of action. Thanks again for joining us on this episode of Decoding Cashflow, and we'll catch you in the next episode.